Hello everyone and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today as we are going to speak about gamification versus game-based learning. My name is Paulina, I am a community manager at iSpring and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. As a guest and presenter, we have a very, 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 very special Andrew Hughes. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Hi. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for asking. We met Andrew at one of the eLearning Guild conferences, and I believe it was DevLearn, I think. And Andrew is a president and founder of Designing Digitally. It's an e-learning and serious game development firm uh, that creates uh, retention solutions for various types of industries. And today, Andrew is going to be presenting for you. We also have today with us Elena Galvez. Hi, Elena. Thanks for joining. Hi. Elena is our customer care manager and she primarily works with iSpring clients helping them to decide how iSpring can be a perfect fit for their needs. At the end of this webinar, Elena will reveal a very special bonus for all webinar attendees, so guys make sure to stay with us till the very end. And also we would love to hear from you, so uh, you can submit your questions, comments or concerns in the question box on the right side of your GoToWebinar panel. And don't forget to ask Andrew any questions that you want. We're going to hold Q&A session at the end of this webinar as well. And at this point, I'm ready to pass over the mic to Andrew. So Andrew, you're more than welcome to begin. Fantastic. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And um, if I can go ahead and be able to share my desktop here. Um, Polina, can you give me... Sure, one moment. Yay! Okay. Awesome. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you, everyone. My name is Andrew Hughes. I'm the president of Designing Digitally, and today we're going to be talking about the difference between gamification and game-based learning. Um, I think this uh, picture here uh, sums it up quite well. Um, if you uh, remember anything from the 1990s, there was this uh, TV show in the United States uh, called Mad TV, and they had um, the Spy versus Spy. And uh, basically, these two spies were identical, uh, but were against each other. Um, but had so many similarities that they continuously never could catch each other. Um, and I find that with gamification and game-based learning, they are so very similar, um, but they are so very different that this representation is probably the best way to get an understanding of the two. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're really going to, to uh, show the contrast and the differences between these. Um, but first and foremost, uh, Paulina did explain who I am. Um, I'm Andrew Hughes. I'm the president of Designing Digitally. I'm also a professor at the University of Cincinnati um, and at the Art Institutes, and I also do curriculum evaluations for um, a United States uh, curriculum evaluation uh, agency for colleges. Now, um, designing digitally, uh, as Polina explained, we do um, development of gamified learning experiences and uh, custom serious games for large scale clients, uh, such as Time Warner Cable, Procter & Gamble, General Electric, Toyota, Google, Samsung, Hewlett Packard, so on and so forth. And each one of these that you're looking at are really, quite honestly, running um, both gamified learning experiences and serious games. And we're going to talk about that today because um, one of the things that I want to bring up is that even uh, utilizing something like iSpring, you can actually develop out um, gamified learning experiences um, using that software without having to get into a complex build of a serious game inside of a gaming engine. Um, a little bit more about what we've done. Uh, we've won many, many awards for our uh, developments of serious game and gamified learning experiences, and it's all about that approach in which we're going to talk about today. But the first thing that we need to do is we really need to drill down and figure out what are games. Um, well, games are actually um, a challenge or a scenario. They provide you that challenge and they force you to learn new skills to improve your abilities. Okay? So, for instance, when you first played baseball 
and you um, went up there as a little kid and they put the ball on the tee and you tried to hit it, you missed the first time or you hit the tee. Um, over time of repetition and learning the skills on how to become a better baseball player, you in essence were able to uh, hit it off the tee and eventually get rid of the tee completely. And we're going to talk about how that actually happens and what uh, takes place uh, for you to be able to learn those skills. So the first thing that I want to let you know is, and this is what a lot of people um, quite often talk to me about when they first want to talk about gamification or they want to talk about uh, serious games. They want to say, hey, we want to make a game like Candy Crush, and we want it to be this really cool Candy Crush theme. And all of a sudden, the first thing I tell them is, whoa, 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 stop for a second. The first thing we need to understand is what actual behaviors do we need to change? Because... The, if somebody talks to you about the theme, tell them to pause, stop right there. And the reason why is this. If you've ever been to a casino, there are slot machines everywhere. The slot machines, as far as the neurological responses on your brain, are exactly the same no matter what slot machine you sit down at. So if there is a really shiny, fancy slot machine for Alice in Wonderland and you sit down and play that, it's the same neurological responses in your brain as it was for the old time 3777 slot machines you see here on the screen. What does that mean? That means um, that the theme is just a lure. The theme uh, inside of this or the overarching storyline and goal is just a lure to get people to start playing it. What is the most important with gamification and serious games is the actual mechanics that make up that, that piece. So if somebody starts talking to you about, we want to make this game and I want to theme it like this and I want it to be about this, stop them right there because the theme doesn't necessarily matter. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So I think this is a great example. Um, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to play Farmville or check out Farmville, um, but Farmville um, basically is a time-based medium game that allows you to do back-breaking work that was taking place in the 1900s. Now, 10 years ago, if you would have walked into um, a video game company and told them, let's make a game where we do all this back-breaking work that we did in the 1900s, but we're going to make it into a video game, you would have been laughed out of here, um, out of the entire room. But now what you're finding is that people are actually interested in playing these games, not necessarily because we're doing back-breaking farming, but because what we're doing is gathering and allowing time-based medium games become of interest to us as a society. And all of these apply. So it's not just Farmville. It's Clash of Clans. It's um, all of the different time-based mediums games are out, Simpsons, um, Family Guy, uh, so on and so forth that you see kids playing these days. Now, one of the greatest examples that I would like to show um, that I think has been put together when it comes to building out an effective um, experience of a game is Pizza Hero. This was made by Domino's Pizza, and it's free in the actual app store. Um, and what you do is you learn how to build the pizzas uh, that Domino's makes. Now, and you get points, there are timers, so on and so forth. Now, what they did is they took this to a completely different level. Not only did they build out this game for you to play and put it out free to, their, uh, to the public, they actually went ahead and collected the data of these people that are taking this, and the top 5,000 uh, people, they turned around and, in essence, uh, talked to them and attempted to hire them because they were already trained on how to make the particular pizzas at Domino's. So this is a great way of showing how a serious game can actually uh, be an effective learning tool. Now, what is actual gamification? Here's the best example I want to give you. I have um, next door to me a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. It's my neighbor's kids. They're great kids. And uh, about four years ago, I was outside, and I have a big tree out front, and this tree drops a ton of leaves. And I would be there raking the leaves, and the kids would come over and jump in the leaves and have a great time. 
And then all of a sudden I asked myself, um, how can I get these kids to help me rake these leaves? And, you know, I first started on a traditional method where I said, hey, Alex, Bella, can you help me rake these leaves? And, you know, that lasted about a uh, whole five seconds before they became disinterested and uh, moved on. So I then started thinking to myself, well, the reason why they didn't want to rake the leaves is I gave them no motivational factor. Um, they were doing something that wasn't very fun, which is raking those leaves. So I decided the following year to go out and I bought a 99 cent trophy. And I took that trophy and I bought a stopwatch at the same time. And I came home with all these leaves in my yard the following year and I got two big trash bags. And I walked over to Alex and Bella and said, hey, I have a game for us to play. We are going to see who can rake up and fill up the bins the fastest with leaves from my yard and the winner gets this 99 cent trophy. And from there I had a whistle and I blew the whistle and we timed it and every about 15 to 30 seconds I would yell out loud um, how, much, how long that it's taken them. And what ended up happening is these kids had fun raking up my leaves when the prior year they wouldn't do it for more than five seconds. That is a great example of what gamification can do for people. So gamification, in essence, is using game mechanics, such as, in the story that I just told, the uh, whistle, the timer, and a reward, an intrinsic reward, which is your uh, trophy, um, to allow for them to do something that is not very fun. So what isn't gamification? Gamification is not an established and a set up already, ga uh, already created game. There's no... Um, tough thing that they need to get through or something that they don't enjoy to do that we're putting mechanics on top of. This is an already established game. This is not gamification. These are already established games. And we all know that Call of Duty is not gamification. Again, already established game. So what is gamification? Gamification is taking boring a boring process. Maybe it's a meeting. Maybe it's, um, uh, let's say, filling out paperwork, um, uh, filling out information on a website, um, doing some research. It's taking something that you may not enjoy to do as a work process or a process at all and adding these four elements to it to make it fun and less painful for the users and more motivate, uh, give them more, more motivation to actually complete the effort. So the uh, four major components are mechanics. This could be cues, this could be access, it could be incentives, the reward schedule. When do they get the reward? I told you uh, when I was talking to the kids that I said the person that fills the, 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 gets all the leaves and fills the bin up the most gets the trophy. That was my reward schedule for them. The reward, it was a trophy. It was a 99 cent trophy. Here's the thing you should know. People are about status. So these kids look at a 99 cent trophy and say, well, you know, that's only 99 cents. But the thing is, it's the status of beating um, his brother or sister at this game that, and having that trophy to rub in their face is what really motivated them to do it not the actual tangible trophy itself, but the, sim, uh, the symbolism behind the actual trophy. Then you have measurement. You know how I was measuring the kids. I stated to you that when they fill up the bins, so I could tell who put uh, more in the actual bins, um, and they cleaned up all the leaves and whoever had the most. That was my ability to have that, to understand their measurement. And then their behavior. Um, one of the things that this does is gamification actually makes it loyal and, that, and allows them to enjoy it. I have a higher quality of leaves raking up um, each uh, fall. And you know what's crazy is every fall, once the leaves end or uh, fall down, these kids ask me, when are we going to have our tournament? And now it has become an annual tournament between this brother and sister to rake up the leaves. And it all started from a 99 cent um, trophy, a whistle, and a timer. And that is what gamification is about.
So the first thing um, when looking at that, um, and I'm going to go through all four of these real quick. Um, I talked about each one of them there, but um, gamification is made up of mechanics. That is points, levels, progression bars, leader bars, badges. Um, the feedback's got to be constant. You have to be giving it over and over and over. That's why I told you about every 30 seconds I would tell the kids when, um, when what time it was, um, and how long they've been doing it. Um, so that I can cons uh, consistently uh, provide them pressure and energy back. Um, and then I was able to measure by seeing how much time was invested by them, how long it took, and how much the bin was full. And then also I can see their behavior. Each and every year they come back asking to do it again and again and again. And it's all about the trophy when that trophy is only 99 cents. And again, that recognition and status. People love um, to symbolize status. Um, for all of us in society, we symbolize status uh, by the clothes that we wear, the cars that we drive, the houses that we own. Um, we symbol status. We show success through, that th uh, through those items. Um, that same situation happens with virtual goods, badges. Um, all the badges are are basically status indicators that you've completed something. Um, that works really well for your overachievers, but your socializers and your low performers, they don't necessarily give uh, a, a care about the actual status. Um, they are more interested in uh, maybe another motivational factor. So don't take into consideration when working with this that everyone wants a badge. Um, that is an assumption that many people make with both serious games and gamification that we need to have a leaderboard and the badges. Well remember leaderboards and badges only work for your high performers which those are the people that you're not necessarily um, trying to train the majority of the time anyways. So I want to ask you guys a question real quick um, and I'm not sure if I can see the chat um, but um, let me ask you what is your favorite loyalty program? Does anyone have a favorite loyalty program? Um, here in Ohio, in the United States, uh, we have Walmart um, and we have a um, grocery store called Kroger. And Kroger has a loyalty program um, that tracks uh, everything that we have purchased and then gives us receipts and um, coupons uh, for uh, related items. And I didn't know if uh, anyone else is in any type of loyalty program. And if you don't think you're in a loyalty program, well, you probably are. I think that we have uh, a lot of answers like Air Miles, CVS, American Express, uh, JCP, Hilton Owners, CVS uh, any again. Windoms? Any, any Windoms? Ladies and gentlemen, you need to you need to get to your Windom points up. They're giving them two for one right now. <laughs> City Bank. Just saying. Yeah. We work with Wyndham Hotels. <laughs> so, um, thanks for letting me know that, Lena. Yeah, that's um, a lot of uh, airline companies, a lot of um, uh, hotel chains, stuff like that. Thanks a lot, you audience. Right. <laughs> you know, the first one that actually we saw as a virtual currency, or what I consider being the original gangster of virtual currency, um, was American Airlines. American Airlines came out with the airline miles. Um, Two weeks later, Delta um, released their airline miles system, and virtual currency was basically started from the airlines uh, giving away miles. Now, the funny part about virtual currency is it's hard to be able to tell the, the uh, monetary value of virtual currency. So 10,000 free air miles might equate to, you know, 100 bucks, if that. Um, just depending on how that works. And the biggest thing you should know about virtual currency is they don't necessarily want you to be able to put a tangible dollar on that virtual currency. So they fluctuate it and it moves quite often. That's why if you've ever tried to cash in your airline tickets uh, to go overseas, uh, you, can, you are bound and determined about wipe yourself out. Um, just because um, the currency and the exchange rate of those virtual currencies is, is sometimes very hard and difficult to understand. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a gamification example. Um, this is completely open source, um, and it is not, so you know, it is not like iSpring, um, it is not a software where you build 
um, you're, you're learning inside of. It's an actual classroom um, system. And it's called Class Dojo. It's completely open free, uh, open source. It's for in-class instructors. Um, and basically what it is is um, allows you to have your leaderboards, point systems, and for you to keep track of students in the classroom and how well they're doing. And I'll just show you a quick video of that here real quick of, Hello, my name of is somebody Tyler using Keith. it. I teach fifth grade here in Nampa, Idaho, and I'd like to show you how I use Class Dojo. First off, as you can see here, I am walking around the room using my phone. Um, luckily, I have an iPhone 4. And I walk around the classroom, and as students are doing what they're supposed to, they get the positive um, sound and go around and check their work. And again, as you can see, the student here gets another positive. Next up, as you can see here, I have daily language up on the board. And as students answer the questions correctly, not only do they get a positive off the class code, they get a to turn in for prizes later. So students know how to come up and grab their key book, as you can see here. And I'll pause that just for a second. I don't know if you guys heard that, but there, he actually added in not just this class dojo, but his own um, virtual currency for kids to be able to keep them motivated. And so this actual system um, allows you, and again, it's just class dojo, you can look it up, allows you if you are in the classroom uh, to be able to keep track and um, have a points tier structure for your students. Uh, and it's completely open source and free. Now, another good example of gamification is what you see um, with the whole health boom uh, industry on wearable devices. Um, right here, you're looking at the Nike Fuel Band. We've had the Fitbit and about a half a dozen more. Um, the Apple Watch now comes with a heartbeat uh, monitor, which I think is amazing. Um, and the reason why I state this is this is a great example of gamification. This is putting points behind your movement and activity. Um, that is, some of us, like myself, are bigger guys. We don't like to have to go move as much as we should. So in regards to that, <laughs> something like this will help keep me motivated to know that I'm getting progression through points, which makes it uh, a little more fun to do. Now here's the problem with that. This is why I tell you about leaderboards and how they can be ineffective um, if you have overachievers. So this is my uh, buddy Robbie. Robbie is a lawyer in Florida. He was a college buddy of mine, um, and he lives um, right on the coast of Florida in Miami. He gets to go running every single morning. I live in Ohio in the United States. We get about two and a half to three months of good weather, and that's all. So if you see here, he has 503 miles down. I am competing against him with 73.4 miles. So quite honestly, there's no possible way that I have any way, shape, or form of even catching Robbie. Um, so, you know, looking at this leaderboard, I have no incentive to move forward um, because I know that this is an unattainable goal for me. So leaderboards should be relative, even if you're doing them for gamification. So gamification can be everywhere. This um, here is a video that I like to show. It's about this um, really interesting child. He's about three and a half, almost four, and he you can just watch him talk here and understand that he gets what motivation of game what gamification can do for motivation. So Kiva, okay, what's the site called? Zamzy. And um, dot com. Dot com. Who's this little guy over here? My my little character. And what are these circles next to it? Little badges. And so what are badges all about? Well you move around to the badges. It gives you badges for Stuff like you're running around and jumping on the trampoline and going up staircases. Do you like getting badges? Yes. Can you tell me what you like about getting them? Well, they just, they just really good because, whoa, oh, I like getting badges because, because I can get to the, I'm almost at the end of the end of Zed just because of my badges. I think. And so having badges might help you level up in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why do you like to level up? Because the more you level up, the more energy you got, and the more. You see, today I've got like. Well, which comes first, your level of activity or the badges? 
So I know it's a, uh, it might be hard to decipher, but here's what's happening in this uh, child's head. He's realizing that these badges are, are the motivational factor. He gets more badges, he gets points, he can spend the points on virtual currency with inside of here. And at the, all at the same time, the way that he gets the points is by exercising. So taking something that uh, we have a terrible, terrible childhood obesity problem here in the United States. And uh, what this ZAMZ system is doing is allowing these kids to be able to track their progression um, to ensure that they're staying healthy and, and, and active. This is a great example of gamification for children. Now, let's talk a little bit about game-based learning. What game-based learning is, is doing competitive exercise in, uh, exercises against somebody or within um, a systematic structure that's already been established um, to motivate them to learn better, to, to, to get better with inside of the game. So for instance, and this is what I love to tell people, um, you know, games often have a fantasy element, but here's what I can tell you. Game-based learning, a great example of this is, and I have yet to lose this bet, and there's a lot of people on this um, desktop chair, so uh, hopefully I still don't lose this bet. Um, for the PlayStation, there is, in PlayStation Xbox, there's a video game, Call of Duty. Um, if you ask a son or daughter that plays Call of Duty, what is the best sniper rifle to be used in an urban combat setting? your son or daughter will be able to answer that question within about 10 to 15 seconds. And here's why. Because game-based learning has taken place. Your son or daughter started playing Call of Duty. When they were playing Call of Duty, they were getting shot by snipers. They realized by playing that game and by exercising and repeating and continuing to play that game that they, in essence, got better and more skilled at that game. They are learning how to survive in that game. So therefore, if you ask your son and daughter that question, they've learned that information to be able to survive with inside of that game experience. That is what game-based learning is. It is not what gamification is. Gamification is taking something very boring and adding game elements to it um, to make it a little less boring. Game-based learning is actually learning and improving a skill to survive with inside of a game. So a great example I want to show of game-based learning, um, and I'll fast forward this real quick, or uh, I'm sorry, a great example I want to show of gamification um, is uh, what we did as an example to show people how you could take uh, something very boring and um, add those elements to it uh, to make it uh, seem a little bit more fun. We've all had to wake up in the morning and go to work. Um, it's exhausting. Um, sometimes we just don't want to do it. Um, so what we did here is, is shown you what you can do from a mechanic standpoint to make something like um, you know, just getting ready for work um, more engaging and more fun. And what you're going to see here in just a minute after he gets through all of this is you're going to see a handful of different types of game mechanics and games. So for all of you, uh, here what you're going to see is Fruit Ninja. So again, he's doing something um, that you would normally do in life, just get ready in the morning. And um, we have put mechanics around that and overlaid this to give you an understanding uh, and a better stature of what gamification actually is. Again, this is what gamification is. And you can't have any type of, of game anything without a zombie mode. Um, so we added a little zombie mode in here for you. <laughs> this is very smart. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so back to looking at a game-based learning. We talked about it a little bit about the t-ball situation. But basically game-based learning is you're inside of some type of game that has been built um, to help you get better at a particular skill. Um, and it's been built from the ground up as a game, um, and you're getting better at it. So it, maybe you, it's wrestling or figure skating or uh, basketball, uh, but you're learning inside while playing that game and getting better at that skill. 
So one of the best game-based learning examples that has ever been created, there's been over um, $4 billion, 12,000 companies that have tried to get um, close to this game, but have not even, even come anywhere near what, where in the world um, is Carmen Sandiego has done for game-based learning. And what do I mean by that? Where in the world of Carmen San Diego, when they built this, they had no intentions of teaching geography to kids. But what they did is they realized that they could use um, the plan of the world as a medium to be able to hide Carmen San Diego. They could have put Carmen San Diego in the kitchen and made you search the kitchen for her, but they didn't. What they used was uh, countries, capitals, cities. Um, to be able to allow her to transfer back and forth and your job is to learn about those cities, get an understanding of where they are, and then try to find her. Um, so, you know, I find that this game um, taught myself and many other people geography, uh, but had zero intent in doing so. But that is a great example of what game-based learning is. You had to learn those uh, particular capitals and these countries and their locations um, and their populations uh, to be able to, to complete the actual task at hand to find Carmen San Diego. So you know you just have to keep that in consideration that this um, has been one of the most successful game-based learning experiences um, that we've seen um, ever. Now, a great way, um, another great example that I find um, to be just extremely close to where in the world San Carmen San Diego, um, obviously never going to surpass that, but um, this game is um, Assassin's Creed. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Assassin's Creed, um, but Assassin's Creed um, built an exceptional game where what they did is they depicted the American Revolutionary War. And, you know, I currently um, have a master's degree and I'm working on a PhD. And I can tell you that I learned more by playing this video game about the American Revolutionary War than I ever did in any of my um, uh, studies at any level of my education. And the reason why is human beings do not really learn something until they experience it. So what does this mean? This means I was told about the, the Boston uh, Harbor throwing the tea into the water. I was told about all these epic battles. I was told how um, the people, the settlers here in America, treated the Native Americans. And I was told all of this information, but I didn't get to experience it until I played this game. And once I played this game, I had a newfound understanding for the history of of the uh, of establishing America and also of what we did to Native Americans, um, which is absolutely just devastating to me. So if you get a chance, play that game because it's a it's a quite interesting and fun experience. One great example that we did when it comes to game-based learning is we developed out a browser-based environment for the United States Air Force Academy, um, and this game allowed them to virtually experience um, the Air Force Academy and all of the uh, features and the benefits that uh, came with it. And this um, system was actually built in a uh, large-scale gaming engine, um, was browser-based, and was multiplayer that allowed you to virtually interact with the missions rep and also play uh, kick field goals um, at the stadium, uh, play soccer, um, which may be football to you, um, and uh, actually explore the actual uh, campus um, while at the same time uh, being able to interact and, and talk to admissions reps um, if you were interested in actually attending the university. This is a great example of game-based learning where you're learning while playing. So things that we see um, happening in the industry, uh, we're seeing a lot more device usage for game-based learning. Uh, things like the Leap Motion, the Microsoft Connect, Connect 2, the Oculus Rift, Google Glasses, um, we obviously know about the Hive um, and a handful of other 
uh, uh, virtual environment pieces that are now going to be uh, brought into the corporate world. I do think we're still a couple years off before that absolutely hits the larger organizations, um, but we do see quite a few uh, organizations starting to look at these as options. And um, I'm actually going to skip that one, I think, and I'll move on to this one. Um, one example that we did with the motion tracking devices is we built an air marshaling serious game and we took the Microsoft Connect and uh, we developed out this serious game that allows you to do the air marshaling signals and we did it for a customer and your job is to get the airplane through this obstacle course and what you'll be doing is doing the signals and the faster you move your arms and do the signals the faster the plane moves and the plane will turn based on your signals so the first thing you see down here is this is Elizabeth Elizabeth is actually doing that movement um, this is what um, the uh, camera sees so this is her and then this is what she's supposed to be doing once she does it three times and it recognizes the gesture um, it will then say correct and she can then move on um, to the next um, uh, position. Once she does all of the positions, um, she now is set into the first map and her job here is to steer this plane and this plane will turn based on the, the signals that she makes. This type of experience was built to help air marshalers uh, learn how to marshal planes uh, more effectively. So what we did is we actually took the, um, the signals and built this full game, um, this obstacle course game, um, so that they could learn and get more skilled at the air marshaler signals. And as you can see, she didn't do so hot for the poor ducks. The next thing I want to talk about is Gameful Design. Uh, Gameful Design is uh, something that um, has become pretty popular. Um, Gameful Design is when uh, a good example is the whale fail. If When Twitter first came out, um, we uh, all wanted to jump on it and it, it bogged down their servers and, and crashed quite a few of their servers. So they had um, what is called the, the whale fail, um, where the uh, it would be a 404 error or it would be a server down error. And instead of just saying server down for Twitter, what they ended up doing is building this gameful design where they built out this uh, whale as the fail icon for uh, when the servers went down. And um, what that does is allows uh, for the user uh, to not feel so upset or frustrated um, by utilizing something like Gameful Design. Now a good example of Gameful Design, which I think should be on the next slide, is Domino's Pizza here in the United States has Pizza Tracker. This is a great example of Gameful Design. The Pizza Tracker does nothing but tracks how long it's going to take for you to get your pizza. But what it does is it has all this fun theming experiences around it. Oh, that is not the right video. Um, it has all these experiences around it. And um, I don't, Polina, I think that video got messed up, but that's okay. I think maybe um, that was the one that you missed. That might have been the one, so I apologize. Um, but the pizza tracker from a gameful design standpoint, if you guys can see my um, Domino's pizza tracker, Let's see if I can show you just an image real quick. So this is the Domino's Pizza Tracker. Um, with the Domino's Pizza Tracker, um, all it does is tell you where your pizza is uh, in relation to being uh, from the time you order to when you uh, it arrives at your door. They built all these different, there's six different themes for this pizza tracker. This is a great example of gameful design, where there's not an actual game that's built for it, but it gives you something fun and playful um, while you wait. And that is a great example of what gameful design is. Diana says that she uses the pizza tracker and she loves it. Yay! Well, then let's, explain, let's talk about this because um, we're, this is the best chart I have for everyone here. So if there's no gameplay but it's fun, that's gameful design. That's your pizza tracker. You can't do anything with it, but it's still fun to watch. That's gameful design. If it has a purpose but little to no gameplay, like it just has the badges, the um, the timer, so on and so forth. That's gamification, okay? So that's raking the leaves. 
If it has purpose and gameplay, that's a serious game. So the purpose of the air marshaling game was to teach them how to be, get, get better at, more skilled at doing the air marshal of signals. So it had a purpose, and, it, and the gameplay of it was to be the, do the obstacle course. If it has gameplay and is just for fun, that's a game. So that's what the, the Assassin's Creed was. So when doing either of these, there's some best practices that I want to put in, uh, talk about, and then I should be um, uh, uh, wrapping up here. And uh, um, before before you get to this, I wanted to mention really quickly that yes, the PowerPoint uh, slide deck will be available after the webinar. So don't worry, guys, if you miss some information. Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the best practices, uh, a couple things. Play games, many different genres and formats, even games that you might think are absolutely stupid or no interest to you. Play them because you've got to learn the gaming elements. Think about the learning first. Um, make sure that you determine objectives and measurements. Um, and then create reward systems using those learning goals. Um, again, my goal for the kids was to rake up the leaves, so I put mechanics all the way around on that to give them pressure, a, a reward, and uh, constant feedback, which would allow them to continue uh, moving through that process and not get bored within the first five seconds. Emphasize a behavior change. Um, you must make fun a metric. So if you interview the people afterwards, you need to ask them, how fun was this? Um, because if it's not fun, they're not going to do it. You just uh, had the example from the students, or from my neighbors. Um, it wasn't fun the first year, so they didn't do it. Um, create uh, or implement mechanics, rewards, measurements within the design document. Make sure you talk those through before you even build anything. And then develop in sprints. Uh, make it an agile methodology. Um, and the one thing I can tell you is you're going to want to play test and revise that thing over and over and over again because you will find that um, you need to make sure that there's there's a more um, testing time than there was with, let's say, a linear e-learning module, um, because it's more sophisticated. And then what happens after you build something like this? Like, what do you do next, and how do you know that this is a success, and what should you do? Um, well, the question is, how do you show ROI? Um, you should have asked yourself at that at the beginning. Um, so ask yourself, um, can I compare this to a traditional presentation e-learning module? Has this been more effective for them? Uh, can we make a control group and take a look at that and uh, just use a control group and see how their performance increases? Um, how do we nurture this? Um, for instance, uh, rather than just saying we put this up in our LMS, now you must go take it, um, you need to make sure that you make this exciting for them. Um, don't if you're going to put a reward system in place. Whoops, sorry, ah, go back. Ah. Um, if you're going to put a reward system in place, do not uh, use money. Use status. So um, use things like badging. Um, use things like uh, trophies. Use things that they can actually uh, put in front of of them and say, "Look, this is mine. I won this because of this." Um, but don't don't just give them bonuses or money. Um, it's got to be something tangible that they can look at each and every day. And then possibly tie it into performance evaluation. Find out if this, if this is a sales experience that you're building. Um, take a look at that performance um, this year. Give them that sales training. And then take a look at that performance afterwards and see if it's, at, it's improved. And then uh, you can make that your control group to determine on uh, where your baseline standards um, sit um, from this compared to, let's say, your traditional e-learning. And I know I, I did go quite fast. Again, uh, Polina explained uh, the, the slides are available. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have questions, uh, you can take a look and get a hold of me on Twitter. Um, and you can shoot me an email at andrew.hughes at designingdigitally.com, and I can answer any of your questions um, at any time. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think it was amazing. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, just wanted to ask first, since we don't have too much time left, are you okay going a little over an hour to answer some of the questions? Because we have a lot of them. Yeah, Is that sure. Okay, we that okay for you? okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, and let me share my screen first, and then. Um, I need to stop doing that now.
All right. There we go. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. And now I will pass the mic over to Elena to walk you guys really quickly through our special offer for everyone. And then we will quickly go to the Q&A section. Yeah, we have a lot of questions and we'll be happy to answer them and I'm sure Andrew can help us with that. <laughs> and um, so for all webinar attendees, we have this special bonus. So if you are interested in our products or services, we are offering a 20% discount. So you can purchase a new license or uh, additional licenses or maintenance. And this offer uh, is valid till September the 7th. And if you are with an academic or a nonprofit or a government institution, we will be happy to um, add this offer to the standard discount that we have for those instit institutions. So if you are interested in this offer, please just send your contact information in the chat box. So we'll contact you right after the webinar and send you some more information on this offer. Yeah, Elena will send you the direct link with the special yes. purchasing options. Yes. And now let's move on to the questions. So um, first question, and Andrew, I told you we will have a lot of them. Actually, we had a couple of those questions like uh, this one. Um, how can gamification be created with iSpring? Yeah. Um, actually, um, Helena and I were talking about this before. You know, one of the things that you have to understand is um, iSpring has the ability uh, for you to have quiz questions. Um, it has the ability to have timers, um, uh, badging and point structures. Um, so again, just like I was talking about in my example, um, you, you're making a traditional PowerPoint presentation. Um, take a look at some of the, the interactive uh, assessment pieces and interactivity pieces that they have with inside of that. And then think to yourself, just like I did with the mechanics. I added just one or two different mechanics um, to that um, process for those kids. If you do that with inside of your learning experience, um, maybe an assessment question, um, you can actually then add in that by just utilizing um, some of the existing systems that they already have. And Polina, you could probably explain some of that a little bit more, right? Um, sure. From what we've been uh, talking about before, uh, we know that my apologies about that. Um, for example, in iSpring QuizMaker, it's possible. What are what are some of the gamification elements? First of all, uh, the possibility to award points for each question, and then limit time that a user can spend on a question or a quiz. Also, a uh, number of tries can be also set for each question or each quiz. Then we also have spot hotspot questions and drag and drop types of questions and according to entry this all can be considered as a gamification elements yeah that's correct and, and it, it comes down to the creativity the tools are there absolutely, absolutely. a few of those and, and mash them together to make uh, something that is fun and engaging Yes, and also what we've been talking about is iSpring Talk Master. This is the uh, conversation simulation tool. You can create a real-life conversation for like sales salespeople, people who work with clients, and then have a nonlinear structure to it, so that when um, a learner decides what, like how should he or she respond to a phrase that client says, it actually leads him to the next level and uh, you also get the mood change for the client so you can understand the reaction yeah and I was checking that out earlier today it's actually really cool so um, you guys should really check that out how about I pass pass the presenter rights to you again Andrew and you could have uh, the web the, the slide with your contact information up Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Um, one second. Uh, awesome. And moving on to the next question, would you please define time-based game? Oh, time-based medium. Um, yeah, okay, so um, for a time-based medium, something like Clash of Clans, 
um, Farmville. Um, basically, the way that it works is this. Um, you do a specific amount of actions or a set amount of actions, and then you have to wait 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a day, two days, so on and so forth. Um, and things like Farmville, that's exactly how they're set up. They're set up because uh, us human beings are very impatient people. So they realize that you can plant your beans in Farmville, and you can wait five days, or you can pay um, 25 cents and have them um, automatically grow and sprout right now. And so those time-based medium is what I like to call them, or the, the uh, Clash of Clan uh, types of games, or the Farmville types of games. Um, basically what they do is they, they are, um, they're, they're triggering our impatientness, and they're uh, allowing us to have fun, but they're really set up to um, get us to purchase and and really tie into that uh, impatientness that human beings have. Awesome. Thank you very much. And before we move on to the next question, I think I have a wonderful idea. Um, if Andrew, you are okay with that, we can work on a blog post for the next week that will have the webinar recording and also the slide deck in it. And also we can include some information about how iSpring can have gamification elements. Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Okay, next question from Robert. Do you have a list of things that work for different people, especially if a leaderboard doesn't always work for mid-level people? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so um, here's what I would do. Um, rather than just saying, oh, well, all socializers like this or um, all underperformers like this. Uh, what you really have to do is figure out what the motivational factors of that particular group is. Um, so for instance, human resources, um, the division of human resources with inside of your organization, um, they might not have the same motivational factors as your salespeople. You know, they're, they're, they're not working off of commission. Um, and so you have to be, start to talk to them and figure out, okay, human resource division, what motivates you, why does this motivate you, um, what would make you happier, um, how could we make that happen, um, and from there you can actually determine on what those motivational factors are, and then utilize those motivational factors. For instance, one of the things that we did with a company is rather than give bonuses to the salespeople, what we did is the, the company was a very large company here in the United States, and they had sponsorships with uh, athletes, and so what we ended up doing is since they already had the athletes on retainer, we ended up having the athlete come in one day and doing a lunch with the um, with the high performers, or not the high performers, the um, the ones that were on the top of the leaderboard. Now, here's the thing you should know about that. Before this, we had a certain demographic that was always at the top of the leaderboard. As soon as we introduced this whole, you can have lunch with the celebrity that we knew was. Um, highly respected by the demographic that we were trying to target, all of a sudden the entire leaderboard flipped. And nobody would, that was on the top ten, uh, 20 uh, the week before were even on the top 20 after that. Wow. Why? Because we found that motivational factor. So leaderboards can work, but you've got to have the motivational factor behind it. Thank you. And a question from Christine. What kind of game elements would be easiest to implement for instructional designers who don't have the time or skills to learn more complex game development? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Polina and I were talking about that with um, uh, some of the iSpring, uh, iSpring elements. You know, things like um, adding in a timer to mm -hmm. some of your questions. Um, uh, adding in things like a mood or um, an indicator, a status indicator of some sort. Um, adding in maybe just a really quick mini game rather than just a drag and drop uh, matching uh, piece of it. Um, and just being a little bit more creative with your interactive assessments. I think that's one of the biggest things from the instructional design side. Like we, it, this is the best thing to say. Um, instructional designers, I love you guys. Like we're, I'm on your team. What we need to do is we need to be more creative when we make our assessments. Like we've all done multiple choice, drag and drop matching since we were kids with number two pencils uh, in, in, in grade school. So from an instructional design standpoint, you can still do a matching, but make it a little bit more creative. Awesome, thanks. And uh, a question from Susan. Do you think that gamification can be used to update or replace traditional assessments with higher education? 
I think it's going to because the, uh, okay, I'm I'm 35 years old. I am the last generation that understands what it's like to uh, not have the internet, um, and so. And and what we're finding is these kids are picking up the iPad, um, you know, at at very young ages, and they're being bombarded by games, by uh, Pokemon Go, and everything. <laughs> and what you what you're finding is they these motivational factors that get these kids to play these games um, are going to bleed into the corporate world. It's just as we evolve as a society, baby boomers start to retire, um, we're going to see more and more of this gaming and fun included into the training. What I think is funny is company cultures, um, the what we call the front line of companies, marketing, sales, advertising, um, all of that, administration, they want a fun, loving, great culture, and they want a fun environment. They want an exciting environment. They want people to be happy in their environment. But when it comes to training, they don't have that same mentality. That's what's going to switch. We're going to see that that same culture is going to go all the way across the board of not just in the front line but the back end too, which is us and the HR and the training side of things. Thank you very much. And a uh, question from Neil. What experience do you have in implementing accessibility into serious games? You know, <laughs> um, that's a funny one because we have to deal with that quite often. Um, here in the United States, uh, we have to be we have to do 508 JAWS, uh, 508C compliance. Um, and what we find is uh, there's a lot of times that you really, it takes you probably twice as long or if not um, at least 60% longer um, to ensure that that accessibility is in there. And then you have to ask yourself, um, if you're building this game, does it have to be in 3D or could it be in 2D? And if it's in 2D, um, could we build it in a system that allows it to be um, easily accessible um, through uh, things like the JAWS reader, uh, so on and so forth? So in my opinion, um, it's, it's a challenge, but it definitely can be done because if you can do traditional e-learning modules like that, um, you can definitely add some game mechanic elements to that. Now, in serious games, it just depends on what you're building. Um, the toughest part is things do move fast in serious games, and so uh, some, of, uh, some of that identification and accessibility can be tough. Now, if you're not talking about that and you're talking about accessibility from a user standpoint, getting access to the systems, um, well, what we have found is uh, we always do an analysis up front to figure out what is going to be the best technology to actually utilize um, when developing out these learning experiences. And, you know, things like uh, evaluating iSpring and Captivate and Storyline and, and uh, and then gaming engines like Unity 3D and Unreal and Havoc and the Hero Engine to see what's going to be the best option. Um, and then don't overcomplicate it. You don't have to make this big, crazy game if you just need them to learn how to do arm movements. Mm -hmm. um, so try to keep it simple. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, Andrew, a lot of people are asking, do you have any type of recommended books, YouTube videos, references for best gamification practices for, for people, for all ice fingers. I do, I do actually. Um, if you take a look, um, there's a couple things that you guys, if you're, if you can see my screen still, um, I don't think, can you see my screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a couple things you guys should know. Um, there are white papers on our website in which you can actually get um, that actually have uh, a learner manager resource guide for gamification. Um, there will be one out next month uh, for serious games. Um, and then we also have a lot of stats for all of you that are saying, well, where's the stats and info on this? Um, you can actually get um, serious game stats um, and all of that information from the infographic on our website. And then um, each and every week on our blog, um, we uh, blog about the four major categories. Um, so e-learning, uh, mobile learning, serious games and training simulations. So if you just come over here um, on our website to let's say serious games, you can view all that's been posted about that and then just continue to go down and take a look. Um, but we have a ton of content for you guys um, and we're basically blogging about um, you know, why employee benefits, the types of video games that support learning programs, which somebody asked earlier 
um, or mm -hmm. what genres. So you guys can kind of look through some of this and get some of that resources. And then you can always uh, reach out to me at the same time, okay? Yeah, Andrew. We will be definitely sharing your contact information with our users. And uh, another interesting sorry, interesting question from Neil. I'm involved in producing a serious games educational portal across Europe within uh -huh. um, STM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This was yep. very useful in defining gamification and game-based learning. Have you been involved in a project like this for educational institutions? And if so, what was the success of it? Um, I have for the corporate side, not for the uh, university side. Um, but here's what I can tell you. Um, I have seen, and I, I have over um, probably, I'd say, when I finished my research, I think I found about 75 different examples of positive return on investments for uh, utilizing um, gamification across portals. And if you see my screen right now, um, especially if you're in the K-12 through um, or you're in the university setting, take a look at open badges. Uh, you can actually integrate using the APIs into any type of uh, login system that you utilize. And uh, you can actually have your badging system uh, through this and it's completely open source source. Um, and so I, I'm not sure what tools you're using, but before you go purchasing a bunch of software, um, take a look at open badges. Um, it might be a great example for you to add that badging and recognition. And then uh, we also talked um, about Clash Dojo, um, which does have that um, uh, does have the actual tracking system and is for the mobile, so on and so forth. And right now it's being used in two to three, two out of every three U.S. schools. Mm -hmm. And we also have an, a really interesting comment from Marcia. One critique of classroom gamification programs like Class Dojo and Class Craft is that due to eventual habitu, sorry, habituation of to the rewards, the motivation levels of many students will actually decrease after an initial increase. And she's asking, what strategies could you recommend to combat this? You know, the, well, here's the thing. Um, you got You consistently have to keep evolution, and you consistently have to keep it interesting. Um, you consistently have to continue to add in additional rewards and motivational factors that are not just built on your existing system structure. So yes, you'll get that initial, hey, um, look at everybody, they're really interested in this. This is great. And everyone adapts it and then your adaption rate drops off. Well, just like anything, it has to be continuously nurtured or otherwise um, that adoption rate will just continue to drop off. It's called, in my, in my view, it's called the field of dreams mentality. If you build it, they will come. They'll come at the beginning and then it'll drop off and they'll go somewhere else. Um, so adding in different challenges, different uh, rewards and different mechanisms for those rewards um, as you go through, then you'll find yourself um, uh, continuing to see constant evolution and also constant adaption of, that, uh, mm -hmm. of those um, reward mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But you're right. One of the things that uh, she's going to find is that you're going to have your overachievers at the beginning be your top um, uh, score people. Then right. after you root those out, and I hate to say that, but you're not root them out, but kind of push them aside and say, okay, yes, we know you're the top 10 leaderboard over here because you're yeah. the highest performer. But what about the, what about this group? Who is who's got the highest success percentage? Or who has um, you know done the least amount of calls with the most amount of uh, of success? Um, and then start looking at different ways that those are published on our blog. And thank you very much, Andrew. Everybody seems like everybody liked the webinar, and I'm sure, or and I also hope that now you guys have a better understanding of how gamification is compared to game-based learning, how they are different, and how. All of you can use elements of both strategies. And then uh, last but not least, if everyone, if you uh, go to our website and download the white paper that I was talking about, mm -hmm. make sure you put it in a valid email address because it, it does send it through the email. Um, so um, just make sure you put a valid email address in and if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah, uh, so people are saying thank you, thank you, awesome information. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks from iSpring. <laughs> we really enjoyed having you yeah, during no our webinar.
All right, so... Sorry, sorry I showed my email for a minute there. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I, uh, I got the talking and forgot that I was still sharing my screen, so my, my apologies, everyone. Oh, it's okay. As you can see, I, I have nothing exciting going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, okay, so thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Be on the lookout for any news from iSpring. And thank you, Andrew. Hope to see you sometime you. during our next webinars. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Thanks, Selena. Goodbye, everyone. See you next week. Thank you, Selena. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.